The CIA was established in 1947 as a civilian, nonpartisan, and independent foreign intelligence service. Today, in the wake of the failures of 9-11 and the Iraq War, the CIA has sought to reinvent itself and is now at a crossroads. Douglas London spent 34 years as a senior CIA operations officer. He's authored the new book, The Recruiter, Spying and the Lost Art of American Intelligence. Doug, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on today. Give us an overview of the intelligence community and how CIA fits into that. Well, the community these days is actually made up of 18 agencies. Um, most of them tend to be part of the Department of Defense. The CIA, as you said at the beginning, was created in 1947 to be an independent organization, one that really was not among the policymakers. And the reason for that largely was so it could be able to speak truth to power, that it wasn't grading its own homework, if you would, grading its own policy recommendations. The CIA was central for a reason. It was supposed to be, if you would, a clearinghouse of intelligence and led by the director of central intelligence, who's now the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And the organization was primarily a spy service, a foreign intelligence collection service. It had a mission for that, for analysis, and covert action. It always did. But its alignment in terms of priorities was really about foreign intelligence collection and analysis in a strategic fashion to provide strategic support to the president and other decision makers in the government. You said 18 organizations mm -hmm. that are collecting intelligence. That sounds like a lot. Is there an opportunity to consolidate that? Well, that's why the CIA today still is the human manager, human intelligence being the actual collection of spy information, but not just spy information because much of human intelligence is also overt. It's that we get from our diplomatic activities, Department of Defense, Treasury engagements, that sort of thing. So the CIA manages it in terms of deconfliction and collaboration and has even before 9-11, but there's a different mission where the CIA is the collector of last resort where a lot of intelligence can be had either rather easily, overtly, or through less risky activities. The CIA is the one the United States turns to when it's really high risk and really great need. So in uh, 2004, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI, was created. Why was it created and what was its purpose? The DNI was created out of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission that reviewed what went right and what went wrong during 9-11. Uh, the bottom line is it went wrong because we had these massive attacks. But a lot of the agencies were doing their work independently and, and to some success. CIA was in fact blinking the red lights of warning according to the 9-11 report for many, many months prior to the attack. And talking about an impending catastrophic operation that Al-Qaeda was planning potentially in the United States. What went wrong mostly uh, for 9-11 was a lack of collaboration, a lack of transparency, and the DNI was decided to be placed above the then DCIA to relieve the director of central intelligence of a lot of those community activities where the director now could focus on the CIA's mission, which essentially had been strategic intelligence and allowed the DNI to be the president's advisor, where that was the director of central intelligence position before, and manage and deconflict. Part of the challenge that came out of it was the DNI didn't get all the teeth that was proposed in the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission. The DNI didn't really have control over the entire community budget, really just the DNI office's budget, that of CIA. But still, the DIA was able to serve a very helpful role in terms of bringing together all the communities when they were providing analysis so their finished products would present a more integrated and inclusive product. And is that working? Is it doing what it's meant to do? I believe that is and has for the most part. I think we've seen a great deal of politicalization of the DNI office over the last few years, particularly under the Trump administration. I think uh, former DNI Dan Coats, uh, Senator Dan Coats, actually did an admirable job. I think his successors, Richard Grinnell and Radcliffe, less so in terms of politicalizing what they were producing for the president, what they were saying to the country. A big role of the DNI is actually supposed to be the country's window on intelligence. Where uh, the CIA actually is a secret organization operating for an open society. So where is the window for that transparency to give the confidence and the, the public security that the community is doing the right thing? If the DNI does the job honestly, it's well. If it's less honestly, then it's hurting both the public and the security of the country. Doug, you said, you know, according to the 9-11 Commission report that the problem was lack of collaboration, lack of transparency. Have we solved that now? If the CIA is blinking red that there's an imminent attack, is that going to bubble up to the point of stopping that attack? 
What's gone well is just that part. It is the collaboration and integration. I think there's a sea change at CIA after 9-11 that there's an almost default to if there's a threat to proceed with a duty to warn that's throughout the community to make sure agencies that have a stake in the matter, such as when there's a threat to the homeland or if there's the involvement of an American, a U.S. person, the CIA immediately contacts the FBI. I, I think it's beyond CYA. I think it's really integrated into the philosophy. I think there have been some negative consequences as well on the missions of the various agencies, which might impede some of what the 9-11 Commission wanted to achieve in terms of preparing the country most to avoid such a, a consequence in the future. But in terms of transparency and integration across the community, I think that part went right. Doug, you say in your book that the biggest threat to the CIA in terms of its relevance and utility is the Defense Department. Aren't we on the same team? Absolutely, uh, but you have to uh, think back to what the environment was at 9-11. The country was in a state of shock and the country was angry and they wanted accountability. They wanted someone or something to blame. The CIA believed actually it was facing an existential threat at the time because of the accusations that the agency was primarily responsible for the attacks and not forecasting them or not preventing them, the agency actually saw the possibility of being absorbed by the Department of Defense or some combination with the FBI to account for its failures. There was actually talk of, we don't need CIA anymore. There was absolutely talk of the CIA did it wrong, so we need to get rid of them and build something else or give that job to another agency in the United States government. That will work. That would work, absolutely. So. DOD is actually doing human intelligence now. And I thought that was strange because I thought that's what CIA does. DOD does and always has done a great deal of human intelligence. It has strategic collectors, but a lot of its collection is tactical to support war fighters and combat theater commanders. I think after 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld felt uh, a bit embarrassed by the way the CIA was able to respond quickly, get on the ground in Afghanistan within 15 days where DOD was having challenges logistically with some of its authorities and in terms of its mission. Donald Rumsfeld basically took advantage of the authorization for the use of military force, the first one that was produced after 9-11 for the war on terror that was followed by another one specific on Iraq that has since been repealed. The AMF did a strange thing in terms of intelligence. It basically made the whole world a combat theater that allowed the Department of Defense to project power but also intelligence collection throughout the world without even really consulting with the ambassadors in those countries or the station chiefs. It got off to a bit of a rocky start because while it certainly was legally their right to do so, it was not really an area of their greatest expertise, particularly when it came to some traditional intelligence operations. And there were quite a few dust-ups. Well, there's also the CIA now getting into things that seem traditionally more DOD's uh, basket, which is so-called kinetic activities. That's really the broader issue that I speak to in the book in terms of the transformation of the agency and, and its culture and its mission that followed 9-11. Coming out of this concern for an existential threat, the CIA was thinking, what can we do to make ourselves still relevant, to make ourselves still important to the White House and the community and not lose ourselves? And, and I think by uh, uh, focusing really on its unique covert action authorities and its agility to move quickly and realign, the agency went very heavy on the covert action side, which meant a lot of paramilitary focus uh, in the counterterrorism world, a focus on what's called find, fix, and finish, geolocational intelligence to find individuals who are threats and, and the most colloquial manner I could say, remove them from the battlefield. But the question was, was this mission, was the mission of having black sites to detain combatants off the battlefield who didn't meet the threshold for traditional enemy prisoners of war or couldn't be prosecuted in U.S. courts? Was the CIA just an easy button that hurt it more over the long run than actually helped it? And I think by spending 20 years focused on primarily combat armed support and picking up missions that were politically convenient for the White House, such as what to do with these combatants, how to pursue al-Qaeda and the likes of Pakistan, it really degraded a lot of its traditional core ethics and focus on foreign intelligence. Well, speaking of politically convenient, I want to ask you about the months and days leading up to the Iraq War mm -hmm. uh, and the linking of Saddam Hussein and uh, al-Qaeda and weapons of mass destruction. What was happening at the CIA? What did you see? It was an interesting time, and it was a slide down the path of which I speak and of which I'm greatly concerned. The National Intelligence Estimate, which the CIA really shepherded in 2002, that 
justify the Bush administration's invasion of Iraq based on the presence of uh, weapons of mass destruction was done in, in, a, in a very unlikely way for the CIA. The CIA has a very rigid, uh, rigid in a good way, exhaustive due diligence for intelligence it produces for decision making. That's the final products, not the secrets it steals. And there was great pressure from the White House. Uh, Vice President Cheney was a frequent visitor to the CIA who would actually hold meetings with analysts when he was upset or angry or argued with the findings. And you have the Vice President of the United States and a bunch of you know very low-level, mid-level analysts, experts in their field, what do you think is going to happen at the end of the day? That NIE, which was proved to be in error, only had dissent from the Department of Energy and actually the State Department. It's a, a Bureau of Intelligence and Research. The CIA basically stood behind it, but the intelligence was rather narrow, was cherry-picked and often spun to find that conclusion. Well, this is going to sound kind of naive, but how do you um, prevent that kind of politicization of the CIA? How do, you, how do you prevent that kind of pressure to be applied on the CIA? Pressure is going to be there because these are executive agencies, the CIA and the rest of the intelligence community. I think it depends on good leadership. I think it depends for the CIA on having a very strong director of the Central Intelligence Agency who in his or her advice to the president and other decision makers among the principals who make the biggest decisions explain that the objectivity of the agency is in their best interest to give them the right answers, not just answers that support their predetermined conclusions. I but think the president can fire the director at any time. Absolutely, and, I, and, I, and, and, and fired Dan Coats as DNI, right, and replaced him with more politically loyal uh, operatives. So it requires the president, when we speak of leadership, at the top of this, right, to be able to say, okay, I need people to disagree with me. I need people to show me an alternative point of view, and that needs to filter down through his or her agency leaders. Doug, very briefly, what's the biggest challenge facing the CIA right now? The CIA is realigning to the world of great power competition, which is actually more in line with pre-9-11, looking at the plans, intentions, and capabilities of our greatest adversaries and threats, which still includes counterterrorism, but primarily countries like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. We've lost a bit of our step over the years. We've degraded some of our capabilities as traditional foreign intelligence, and we've breeded a, a leadership which has been so focused on covert action, it's going to have to have a shift culturally to go back to that sense of we're a spy service first, and we need to be stealthy, and we need to be successful, and we need to do the right by the American people. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for joining us and for your insights. Thank you.